idea behind him having the whole world in his hands and us singing about it is because we're glad about it. Amen. Amen. Some of y'all are thinking like, good night, what a drag that is. <laughs> and it's okay to smile and clap and sing. Amen. Amen, everybody. Amen. We even got Gator here today, y'all. I think he needs to change his business card. The prettiest grass cutter in Dare County. Okay? I want to make him smile. Let's try that one again. You mind bringing that up a night or two? The, uh, the key. Trying to figure out that, go to Second Thessalonians, if you will. Second Thessalonians chapter one. We'll spend a few moments there this morning, hopefully. Hear what God has to say through his Bible. Anybody here glad about the Bible? Amen. Where would we be, y'all? Where would we be without it? Second Thessalonians chapter one. I'm gonna pick up reading verse three. 2 Thessalonians verse 3. Good to have George and Mary's family here with us today. Y'all go ahead and have some more offspring. We could just invite y'all to church and we'd have a house full all the time. Verse 3, chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Let's pray together, if you will. And Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to gather here today. We believe that this book, the Bible, is the Word of God. And Lord, that in itself is enough for us to rejoice, to rejoice, to rejoice that the God of all of the universe that spoke it into existence went to the trouble of leaving us a book that he wrote such that when we look in it, we can hear, we can see, we can understand things that those who don't pick it up and don't listen to it can never hear or see or experience. What a blessing to have the Bible. Now God, we're asking you this morning as I at least try to always do. We're asking you to come and meet with us according to your promise and teach us, make us see, cause us to grow today because of your word. And that would be the only reason, the only reason. Not me, not anything else, just you. Please then God, pour us out blessings. That is newborn babes drinking, loving, crying for that milk, this sincere milk of the word, causes us to grow. Obviously, we've everyone tasted that the Lord's gracious. Thank you, Father. We pray it in Jesus' name and all God's folks in. Amen. 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 
The uh, passage we've been working on here in the series of messages, uh, some of you remember, I've simply entitled Why, W-H-Y-Y. -Y. We've been looking at Paul's introductory remarks to the believers uh, there in Thessalonica, and in so doing we found answers. Uh, answers to unwritten questions, but nonetheless answers to questions that all believers ask at one time or another, I feel sure. We found six such answers last time. We looked at answer number one, that disciples go through persecution and tribulation in verse four. And that passage answered, if you will, the question, why do disciples go through persecution and tribulation? Today, answer number two, and that is that disciples going through persecution and tribulation is a token of the righteous judgment of God in verse number five. And that answers the question, if you will, why? Why would God allow, choose, cause his disciples to go through uh, persecution and tribulation, uh, having the effect, making you want to run away, uh, having the effect of pressure, like hands on an overinflated balloon. Why would God want his people to go through these hard times? Well, first, I'd like to lean on a couple of definitions. Uh, those of you who know me, I do that almost all the time. Reason being, have you ever had uh, a conversation with someone who used words that you didn't understand? Anybody? Listen, I started making a list up, and I thought, ain't no way in the world I can talk about all that before 3 or 4 o'clock this afternoon. But I narrowed it down to four people. You ever, I, I was fixing to say, talked with a doctor. Then I reconsidered and thought, have you ever, maybe I should put it this way, have you ever listened to a doctor? <laughs> ain't no reason for me to talk to them. I don't understand either their signature or what they're talking about. He used the word irrigate. Irrigate. Now, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sure there's a good meaning for that other than what I know, but that's when you ma uh, water your tomato plants, right? The doctor's going to tell me about that? No. Well, then came another word, evacuate. Evacuate. That's when the alarm blows and you run out of the house and go hide in the woods someplace. No, evidently that ain't what he was talking about. That wouldn't have fit. How about this one, y'all? The word, I guess it's more uh, of a, a suffix, but ectomy, ectomy, that's what he told me, ectomy. Uh, you've heard append, ectomy. You know what that is? That's when they fix your appendix. Uh, how about this one? If you're tender of ear here, cover your ears up. Hemorrhoid, ectomy. <laughs> I'd never heard that word before. I know all about it now. And then there was another one. This one's a little more technical. Fisher ectomy. You got that one? Expert right here. Well, how about a lawyer? You ever had a conversation with a lawyer? Ever tried to read something that a lawyer wrote? This is why I do definitions. The party of the first part. I ain't got a clue, y'all, not only what it means, but why they would say that. Why don't they talk in America? I'm serious. I don't know what that means. Somebody said they don't want you to know what it means. That's why they can charge $130 per hour, even if they're talking on the telephone. You're here to lawyer today. I've already messed up. But I apologize for that. How about this one, y'all? A mechanic. You ever had a conversation with a mechanic not long ago? Had my truck serviced. The dude was walking around my truck with this little box about yay by yay, punching in numbers on it. And then after he'd punch in numbers, he'd stand there for a minute, and my truck would honk on its own. Bop, bop, bop. I thought, it ain't never done that with me. I'm the one making the blooming payments here. Why don't it honk like that for me? <laughs> and then he went to the next tire, did the same thing. Went to all four tires, did the same thing. Laid down on a creeper, rolled up under the truck, pointed it at the spare tire. It did the same thing. 
Well, curiosity got the better of me, and I'm thinking, I need some definitions here. What's that thing you got in your hand, and why does it make my truck horn honk? I'm telling you the true story here, you know. He says it's a TPMS. Amen. That's clear as mud. He says what that means is it's a tire pressure monitor sensor, and you've got one inside of every one of your tires. I said, ain't no way in the world. That thing rolls up and down the road all day long. You know, it's there. And this thing tells it that it wants to know how much air it's got in it and what position on the truck it's in. Do you all know all this stuff? No. I didn't either. But, and it may not be so, but that's what he told me when I wrote him a check out. Well, one last one. Y'all definitions. I like to know what's, what's going on. Walked in the food line some time back. Young boy standing there working in the produce. I said, how you doing this morning? This was his response. This is a true story. Suck dog. <laughs> <laughs> Serious. That's what he said. And I stood there and looked at him like a cantaloupe. <laughs> he looked like he wanted to say something else, but he did. Suck dog. That's exactly what he said. I wrote it down and brought it home. I got to study it. I asked my son about it. Oh, he says, my son said, that's just short for what's up. Dog. Well, I ain't dog. I ain't got to figure that out. So somebody says, I don't need all them definitions. Y'all, I need all them definitions. I want to know what I'm being told. I want to know what the Bible says. And uh, that's the best I can do to explain all that to you. Here we go. Manifest token. Manifest token. Now, I'm not trying to be a wise guy. Phrases like that lose me. What in the world? God just give me his word so he wants me to understand. What does it mean? So we got to do a little bit of digging around. <laughs> Manifest token translates. We got somebody tickled over there. From one Greek word, okay? One Greek word, and it basically means an indication. An indication. Now that comes from a compound word. This helps me is the only reason I bore you with it. It comes from a compound word. And by the way, you're like me, you say, what's a compound word? Well, that's when there's two or more words hooked up together, okay? Compound word. The compound word is first part in or at or on or by. Second part of this word is to show. And I'm trying to put these pieces together for my benefit, but the word then manifest token, to show in, to show at, to show on, to show by. Manifest token equals to show by or, it means to show a token, to have it manifested. It means, if you will, an indicator or an indication. Now see, that helps me a lot. The second word here, simple word, the word judgment, and this one surprised me. I think about a courtroom when I hear the word judgment, but it just means a decision. Uh, you've heard the expression judgment day, and all that means literally is decision day. And that's the day when God will make all the decisions about everyone that's ever lived. It won't be decision day for me and you. If you will, today is decision day for us. It's going to be decision day for God. So anyway, if you'll merely substitute these two definitions into this text, verse 4 and 5, we have something that can read like this. In all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, by which is shown to us that God has made a righteous decision. Well, I'm thinking I've got the, the grammar, but I ain't sure I've got the meat of that thing. Well, this shows us when I'm going through persecution and tribulation that God has taken it upon himself to make a decision about me about my life. Children, never forget 
With God, it's you and He individually. Okay? It's not, you know, blanket treatment by God. It's not shotgun approach by God. It's a one-on-one -on -one thing. That's why we refer to this Christian life as a personal relationship. No, I've never heard His voice, and no, I've never seen His face. But He speaks to me. Just like He does you, which is what Sarah sang about this morning. He really does speak, and when it dawns on me, and when it dawns on you, God has just told me something. It's a sweet thing, though. And that's how I'm assuming that old boy came up with that, the uh, poem for that song. Uh, he, I go to the garden, and uh, what a sweet sound, so sweet the birds hush their singing, when God the Almighty has spoken to you. Okay, so somebody says, all right, I can buy that. What's the decision then that's been made? Well, there it is in verse 5, right there in the text, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you suffer. And to me, and again, I'm not trying to be foolish, passages like this just get harder and harder as I go. But God's not like me, just loves to hear himself talk. He's not like a politician that likes to just blow air. When God says something, it's for purposes. He wants us to get it. One more definition, of you will, if you will. The phrase, counted worthy, again comes from one Greek word. Uh, and that word comes from the word to judge or to deem, D-E-E-M. Something is being entirely deserving. It means to judge something as being entitled or fit. Now, say something, don't uh, any of you wives be offended at this. My wife told me the other day I was spoiled. Everybody know what that means? Some of you women are shaking your head like, oh, yeah. Say forget. <laughs> now, I got to study that thing. And I thought, wait a minute. I'm your husband. Ain't I supposed to be spoiled? <laughs> you don't want me to go next door and have some other woman spoil me. I mean, and you say, what in the world are you bringing that up for? It is only appropriate, would be my defense. It's fitting that she spoil me. Any amens out of you, men? Thank you. See, we're in the majority now. And I'm thinking that's helping me understand this thing, the idea of being judged as being entitled, as being fit as being entirely deserving. Now, insert this definition, if you will, in our text. And let me ask that question again. What the disciples are experiencing, persecution, tribulation, this shows us what decision uh, that God has made. Here it is. The decision He's made is that you may be judged as being entitled to the kingdom of heaven. That you may be judged as being fit for the kingdom of heaven. That you may be judged as being entirely deserving of the kingdom of God. And if you can, because it's hard following me, hear what this text is saying. God makes the decision that you, that me, that any, that every disciple will go through these troubles, persecutions, tribulations in our lives so that we'll be counted worthy of His kingdom. And again, I'm trying to be foolish, just transparent. I'm thinking, okay, well, I got that part, but it's still, I mean, I'm not, it's not clicking. Especially when you stop and think, this is me now. You don't hear much about this from our pulpits today. And I'm sure this one's guilty as any of the rest of them. In fact, it's amazing to me what we don't hear from our pulpits today. How many books, y'all, are there in the Bible? 66. I'm sure that's what everybody said. And there's like 1,189 chapters. And y'all, like many of you, in fact, I would be kindergarten, you and your doctorate program, You've been studying this. We've been studying it. 
Folks have been studying this thing for a long time. I've been preaching, y'all, for 40 years, and I have yet to preach in all 1189 chapters. What in the world ails me? Y'all don't listen fast enough. That's... I, just, I won't charge you for that. There's a lot of information here, y'all. Why is it we don't hear so many things that are in the Bible? I recently heard, true story, a Christian song, quote-unquote Christian song, it contained the line, I am worth the blood of Jesus. Mm. Mm. I thought, I wish this was like a, a DVD player and I knew how to work it. I could push it to rerun, run that thing back again. Sure enough, sometime later I heard it again. Y'all, look, look here now. If that were true, if that were true, and I don't know what the person's motivation was behind writing or singing this, but just at face value, if it were true that I am worth the blood of Jesus, then Ephesians 2, 8, 9 could not be true. For by grace are ye saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Amen. It can't be both ways. Listen, if I was worth His blood, then I'd just be automatically saved and automatically translated into heaven and automatically receive everything that God has if I was worth it. But I'm not worth it. That's why it took grace. Amen. Anybody here glad for grace? Amen. In this world, I heard an old boy one time, uh, and I don't mean to be talking ugly about the dead, but if there was ever a reprobate, it was me and it was him. A drunk. But he got saved. Praise God. And I can remember him one day holding his hand up in church and just saying, Grace. <laughs> just great. What else is necessary for someone like me? Or someone like that. Now, my guess is, y'all, whoever wrote the, the lyrics to that quote-unquote Christian song, whoever the young girl was that was singing that quote-unquote Christian song, had never heard Ephesians 2, 8, 9 preached. And on top of that, my guess is, neither had they ever heard number 330 in the Baptist hymnal, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a what? A wretch like me. Listen, I don't, that don't take any faith on my part. I ain't John Newton. He probably didn't do half of what I've done. But I know I'm a wretch. I don't believe that person ever heard that thing. Well, I'm backed up a page. I thought this is going to get worse all the time. Number 328 in the Baptist hymnal. You remember this? Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all my sin. In verse 2, dark is the stain that we cannot hide. I don't believe that fellow ever, ever heard this song. What can avail to wash it away? Look. Look, look, there is flowing a crimson tide, whiter than snow. You, me, anybody can be made today. No, folks, <coughs> we will never be worthy of the blood of Jesus, but because of His grace and because of this gift of faith, He'll apply that worthy blood to my, our, anyone's unworthy lives and we'd be saved. That's grace. Amen. Gosh, in this world. I wish I were eloquent enough to adequately describe it. But neither, y'all, are we, apart from His working in us, worthy of the kingdom of God. Anybody here glad for His working in us? Amen. Anybody here glad for... His power that works in us, transforming us, Amen. renewing our minds, enabling us to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, Romans chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. <coughs> I got to thinking about that thing, y'all, and we all know that the Christian walk is described by Jesus himself as being straight and narrow. 
straight and narrow. We've got a little footbridge goes across one of our uh, mosquito ditches, I guess they're called, over in Wang Cheese. And you got to be careful on that thing. You can't just be halfway looped up and fall for 10 minutes and expect to get across that thing. It's like the Christian life. You've got to stay focused. I mean, Jesus said the same thing. And just to back it up, as it were, you remember when he said, uh, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And you're thinking, what else Jesus? I mean, isn't that kind of a tough thing to say? Well, he went on to say, He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I can see everybody in the boat going down. I mean, <laughs> it's because we're all sinful. He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Matthew chapter 10. We're told, walk worthy of the Lord, Colossians 1. Walk worthy of God, 1 Thessalonians 2. The apostle prayed that God would count us worthy of this calling, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. How can this be? How can it be that sinful men, women, and young people, and by the way, y'all, if you'd ever decide to memorize a verse of Scripture, a good one would be Romans 3.23. How many folk have sinned and come short of the glory of God? Oh! And that's a deserved title, you know. That's not honorary. Every, how, how could this be? Well, to my knowledge, there is no one single passage we can turn to and find how to walk worthy of God. How to be counted worthy of God's calling. How to be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. But thankfully, with just a little bit of study, with just a little bit of listening, with just a little paying attention, there would appear to be a Bible character through whom God shows us both why God would want His people to go through hard times, but also how we can be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. Do you remember the old boy by the name of Abraham? Abraham. Now, for our subject, again, this is me, what's interesting about Abraham is that his is a life that to me perfectly models the genuine Christian experience. Maybe you're like me, uh, you, you hear people, uh, how would I say, use expressions to refer to their coming to Christ or their being saved. They're coming up with some new stuff these days. It may be good, I, but I ain't got a clue what it means. But now Abraham's one that I can look at, and I can relate to, and I'm sure you can. Number one, he was called by God in Genesis 12 with promises. That's how God gets any of us. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. I wonder, you know, what promise you heard, you grasped, you embraced. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I'll come in, me and you're going to have a time personally if you'll just open the door. But that's how Abraham came. God said, I can do things with you. You ain't got a clue about how it's going to do it. But I'll do it if you'll serve me. I'm going to give you a life. Second, though, as he responded to God, movement, change, obedience began instantly. You ever hear someone coming to Christ? There's going to be change. You read those first few verses, in fact, verse 4, 5, and 6. He did just what he was told. He got his family packed up. They moved. They went. Well, that's the way it's supposed to be. How about number three? He began a prayer life. In verse 7 and 8, we find him building altars. Yo, this is not a coincidence. He was living the Christian life long enough that he began to realize his real life need. Try and teach someone they need to pray. If they're not walking with God, you're wasting your breath. Why would you need to pray when you're not walking with God, thus you're not 
trying to do anything different than what your flesh tells you to do. One old sister said, I learned how to deal with temptation. I give in. <laughs> there are folk professing to be saved that just give in. How would they need God if all they're going to do is drink and carouse and dope and do everything they want to do? You live for God for about an hour and a half and you find that I need it. And prayer is not merely a routine or a habit. Prayer is a, a, a word, a title that we've given, because the Bible's got it in there, we've given to crying out to God. Peter was in a bind, y'all. He was walking on water. Right? And the Bible says he was walking on water, just like Jesus. But then that didn't work, but for so long. You remember the eloquent, voluminous prayer that he prayed? When he started going down, help! That's praying. That's the real deal. Abraham starts doing the prayer life, if you will. Verse 7 and 8. Next, he stumbles and falls. Verse 11 through 20. His flesh takes him down. No, she ain't my wife. She's my sister. I don't know about you ladies. If I was Abraham's wife and he didn't claim me as his wife, he'd be wearing five across the nose. Anybody? Come on. Hey, don't tell me you wouldn't. You remember what his denying Sarah's his wife meant. She became a part of Pharaoh's harem. You know what that means? Harem ain't got nothing to do with no barbershop. <laughs> Abraham did that. Well, I thought he was a Christian. He was a Christian. But like me, maybe like you, his flesh got the better of him. Down he went. Good night. But you know what? He evidently read. If not, he might have had uh, someone read it to him. Remember Proverbs chapter 24, 16? A just man falls seven times. But he rises up again. Amen. Flesh ever got the better of anybody in here? Yeah. You're, the fact that you're here today rejoicing just proves the Bible. Back up, you come, because it's real. God's in you. He ain't gonna let you lay down there. Gosh. Number five, he made difficult choices that reflected his new birth. Chapter 13, he had to separate his crowd from Lot's crowd. Had to do it, tough as it was. Number six, he had to fight battles in his new faith. 14, 13, he had to rescue Lot. Just like the typical Christian life, Y'all, he experiences supernatural visitations. Chapter 14, Melchizedek shows up. Who in the world was that? Well, you find out after a while that it had to be Jesus. Folks love to argue about it. I ain't going to argue about it. I'll ask him when I see it. How about that? But every one of us experience supernatural things. Maybe don't anybody else believe it. Maybe don't anybody else understand it. But you know, you've had those quote-unquote visitations. Next, he had to make stands for godliness, chapter 14. He stood against the king of Sodom. Next, he sees more of God, chapter 15. God makes a covenant with him. Chapter 16, he falls again in his flesh. His wife suggested that he go get him an additional wife. Husbands, don't ever fall for this one. Amen? You don't agree with nothing I say? I promise you one is a gracious plenty. Amen. Thank you. I appreciate it. Make sure she hears it too. <laughs> Down he went, y'all, but he remembered Proverbs 24. Next, he was asked to make by God a personal and a public commitment. You remember chapter 17, book of Genesis, the thing called circumcision. There won't no walk in the fence pole there, anybody? You gonna walk with me? Stand up publicly and personally make a commitment. It's no different than what he asks from you or me. <laughs> There's Abraham, our hero. Chapter 18, he becomes an intercessor for Lot and his family. Chapter 20, he falls in the flesh again the same way he did before. Anybody here ever make the same quote-unquote mistake over and over?
and over. That, hey, it's typical in the Christian life, but there he is. Number 14, he sees God fulfill a 25-year-old promise. And Isaac is born in chapter 21. I said all that to get to here. Then comes chapter 22, verse 2. And God says this to Abraham. Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, get thee to the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering. Anybody here believe that's really what God said? Amen. Come on! Amen. You know it is! It's in the book! Anybody here know that God weren't fooling? Amen. You know He won't! It's in the book! Abraham began to do just exactly what God said. And you remember the story. He was going through it like he would a biscuit recipe. And finally lifts up the knife, just about to take the son's life. Stephen preaching in Acts chapter 7 said, he, hey, no big deal. He knew God could raise him from the dead. <laughs> I don't know what his thinking was, but he did it. There comes up the knife, and then you remember verse number 12. God's angel told Abraham, said all that just to get to this point. He said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, do thou neither anything to him. Here it is. For now I know, now I know that you fear God. This is God's messenger, carrying God's word. I'm not trying to be a wise guy, but follow me if you will. Uh, listen, what did God mean for now I know? I thought God knew everything always. Does God know everything? Amen. Not a trick question. Of course he does. Absolutely known from the beginning are all his works. Acts chapter 15. He knows everything. What's the deal? The word know there, excuse another definition, you hear it often in the Old Testament. It's a Hebrew yada. It means to ascertain by seeing. If you will, and this is a very rough paraphrase, God says, now I see that you fear me. Now I see that you will fear me. Y'all, there's a major difference between what God knows and what a man has actually done. God knows everything about my life and your life. Uh, he knew exactly when I was going to respond to him, if I was going to respond. He knows the day I'm going to die. He knows the next time I'm going to sin. He knows all of everything about everything. Why would God need to see Abraham do something before he'd say such a thing? Because there's a difference between what God knows and what we do. We could just as easily stand before God one day, and I only lived to 30 years old, and he judged me for what I would have done if I were 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, or 90, because he knows everything except for the fact I didn't do it. Had I been given the opportunity, yes, I would have. But God knows I hadn't done it. That's why our text tells us that it's a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. He wants to see what you and I will do when we're put in a situation where he says, do this exactly the way I tell you to do it. All I can do is infer from this man's life that the way to be worthy of the kingdom of God is to lay down the old life, pick up the new one, and do what we're told from now on. Abraham was ready to follow God, even if it meant killing his son. Whatever you face, I face, have faced, will face, you love God, and if you remain faithful to Him, you're going to do what He says nobody's going to make you. God's angel don't come down and grab you by the scruff of the neck and stick your face in something he wants you to do. He wants to watch you do. Watch me do the faith thing no matter what he asks. I may be overstating this. I don't believe that, man, you can check it out. Everything about our everyday for the most part, we're to have a faith response. What does God's Word say about how I treat this person? 
how I feel about the who knows. Uh, what I'm going to do with how I messed up yesterday. I mean, everything. God's got a way for the disciple to walk, right? It's straight and it's narrow. And it's faithful. It ain't never going to stop while we're on here. Gosh, y'all. I'm going to read one thing and then I'm going to hush, I promise. Philippians chapter 3, you know it all well. I can't help but think this is exactly what Paul had in mind. Verse 13, I don't count myself to have apprehended mind, reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect or complete, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you, i.e., worthy of the kingdom of God, doing what we're told. Today, yeah, but I messed up yesterday. What can wash away my sin? The blood of the cross. That was yesterday. From this point on, I'll do what I'm told. Well, I'm probably going to stumble again today. From that point on, you confess your sin, get up, and there we go. Yo, know, this just thrills the life out of me, making sense of why I'm having to go through some of the things I've been called to go through. God's made a decision to let me walk down a certain path so he can see what I'm going to do with it. Amen. And aren't you glad he's going to be right there, you know, helping you make that every Amen. decision? Every single one. That's why when we come back to church next week, here you go, be careful now. You'll have something to testify about. Amen? We made it this week. <laughs> the account's been totally accounted for. I'm in the black. No longer the red. I'm asking you to pray with me this morning. And while we pray, it could be, I don't know this, it could be that God will quicken something to your spirit. Something you have gone through, are going through, might go through. Set that thing down within the parameters of this verse 4 and 5, First, Second Thessalonians chapter 1. And realize it could very well be God's made a decision to put you in a blessed place. To walk and to walk obediently. And to know it's going to be right there to help you. Oh, don't get no better than that. I want to go to heaven. But until I get there, I want him to walk with me. Amen. Let's pray. Father, what a privilege to be able to see the unseeable. To be able to understand the not understandable. Lord, to be, to be able to make sense of life. never intended it to be a deep, dark secret, but to those who don't want to know. Our prayer then this morning, Lord, is that you help us everyone see what you're doing in our lives and apply it to these verses of Scripture. Please help us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Please let's remain in prayer. Our ladies are going to sing for us. God's knocking at your heart's door. Please respond. And please respond in the affirmative. As they sing, won't you?